Hey gang, I've got good news and I've got some good news. I'm not gonna speak French. We saw how well that went over on the Crepe Suzette video, but we are headed back to the land of frog's legs and the can-can, and frog's legs doing the can-can. Today, we're gonna make my favorite dessert on Planet Fromage. That's right, Ramekin Grand Marnier Souffle. That's what Ramekin today on Eat So Facto. You know, for being such a decadent, luxurious creation, souffle is awfully simple, humble even. It's egg whites folded into a base and baked in a ramekin until it puffs up like a beautiful, luxurious, liqueur-scented cloud. And you'd never know it looking at this humble little egg. At first you think, huh, you're not very special, boring even, basic. But then you get her to break out of her shell and she shows you who she really is, the egg. The she's all that of baking ingredients. I feel just like Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. I think you're extraordinary. Okay, quick history of the souffle. First of all, souffle means to blow, or to puff, or to breathe, and it's hugely important to French culture. From the middle of the 18th century to this very day, souffle has been synonymous with simple elegance. Souffle is everywhere in France. Souffle was even popular with the celebrated filmmakers of the French New Wave. Jean-Luc Godard made a film about a man who's always rubbing his lips because he's really hungry for souffle. Jean-Pierre Melville directed a film about a career criminal who escapes from jail and finally gets his comeuppance after enjoying his last meal meal, a twelfth souffle. Louis Mal made a film about a boy who has a heart condition and so he and his mother eat some crazy steamy souffle one night. <laughs> you think these jokes are funny. You should hear how they play on French YouTube. Whoa. But as for who invented it? Well, no one knows for sure, but we do know where it first appeared in print. Souffle was first mentioned by a chef named Vincent La Chapelle, the famed chef of Louis XV's favorite mistress, Madame de Pompadour, who herself was the great-great-great-great-grandmother of Danny Zuko's hair. And that's how souffle came to be. True story. After La Chapelle came the celebrated chef and restaurateur Beauvillier. While famous for his three chins and a smiley face, Beauvillier was also known for opening the first grand restaurant in Paris called La Grande Taverne de Londres, or the Great London Tavern. I know, I said I wouldn't speak French, but it's what the restaurant was called, so please cut me some slack. But it was another chef, nearly 50 years later, who really elevated soufflés to new heights. That chef was Antonin Carême, probably the most celebrated chef in the history of Frogland. He wrote legendary cookbooks that chefs still referenced well into the 20th century. His book, Pâtissier Royal Parisien, features all kinds of tips about how to reduce the risk of failure when making souffle. Interestingly, at least to me, it is he who really gives souffle its reputation for being finicky. And why is that? It's just eggs, after all. Why do we get so stressed over something so humble? Well, <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. But first, though, I want to get to what gives Grand Marnier souffle its Grand Marnier-ness. It's Grand Marnier. This orange scented liqueur was introduced in 1880. Okay, liqueur. Other than fulfilling a former drama student's need to add a liquid you to everything, what is liqueur? As usual, thanks so much for asking. A drink whose name in archaic French meant dissolve. A liqueur is any distilled spirit that has additional flavorings like herbs, sugar, fruit, spices. Generally lower in alcohol than, say, vodka or whiskey, liqueurs are often about the added ingredient as opposed to the spirit making up its foundation. Grand Marnier, as I said before, was introduced in 1880, and it was fancy pants from the get-go. Supposedly, its very name was invented by none other than Caesar Ritz, you know, of the hotels. Caesar Ritz, the Swiss hotelier whose name loosely translates to salad cracker, was the epitome of luxury. Well, old salad cracker was friends with a guy named Louis Alexandre Marnier, and Marnier and his wife created a cognac flavored with bitter orange, and salad cracker said, mm, Look, this is great stuff, and so we must call it Grant, and your name is Marnier, so we must call it Grand Marnier. <laughs> Grand Marnier will be legendary, or my name isn't salad cracker. At that point, 
Grand Marnier became a symbol of the Belle Epoque. The Belle Epoque, or Beautiful Epoch, was a period in France roughly between 1880 to the start of World War I. This relatively short period, just over three decades long, has nevertheless had a tremendous impact on modern French culture. Much of the food we popularly associate with France came out of this period. The Belle Epoque was characterized by a strong economy, colonial expansion, scientific achievement, and grand art. Just think Jules Verne, Proust, and the Can-Can. Or if that's too hard, you can think Nicole Kidman, Ewan McGregor, and John Leguizamo making himself look super short. I mean, is there anything John Leguizamo can't do? He's like the egg of acting ingredients. Grand Marnier, like John, he's all that Leguizamo and the egg, is wildly versatile. It can go in a margarita, a sidecar, or crepe Suzette, see episode six. But its best use, IMHO, is Grand Marnier souffle. Now, I know what you're thinking. Isn't souffle hard to make? No, it's not. You just put your lips together and souffle. If you can separate an egg, you can make souffle. But look, its reputation isn't warranted. I'm not saying Karem was lying when he said souffle was hard. I'm sure it was hard for him because he was cooking in 1840. He checked the temperature of his oven by sticking his head inside and going, yeah, okay, feels hot. He whisked his eggs by hand with forearms the size of thighs, probably. We have convection ovens and thermostats and stand mixers. Souffle isn't hard. You can do it. Give this little John Leguizamo of the kitchen a chance to show you what he's made of. Here we go. So it's time for taste test, but um, what's funny is we've already done taste test, haven't we? Mm -hmm. But the problem was I forgot to turn on my mic. So uh, we have to, um, yep, there it is. And we have, to, uh, we have to do taste test again, but that's not so bad. You get to eat two souffles in one day. Yeah. So tell everybody what you're gonna eat. Grandma needs souffle. Yeah. 
And when he was two years old, I gave him some and he was so excited about it. This is a picture of, look at how excited he is in that picture. Now, what you, what you can't see in that picture is that like three seconds later, he grabbed the ramekin and then he burned his hand and, and I felt like the worst parent in the world. So you go like this and then This is better than um, a few minutes ago. It's the best one you've made. Do you tell your Do you tell your Do you tell your friends at school? Are you like I'm gonna have souffle today after school? No. Good. I'm more like, hey, look what I have in my lunch. A whole bunch of really good kale salad. I also have got some carrots. I've also got. God, when I was your age, I was eating peanut butter <laughs> on peanut butter on Wonder Bread. Blech. As usual. Click like and subscribe, but also what is a food origin story you want to know about? Post in the comments below. I want to hear about it. Let's choose that. And then when we choose that, we'll dedicate that episode to you. Uh, okay, what's next? Um, someone named Henry knows that um, next week we're going to have ice cream and asks for ice cream. All right, so I guess next week episode, we're gonna to dedicate to somebody named Henry who wants ice cream. Is that right? Yeah. All right, let's explore together on what? Eat so? Facto. Yeah!